Kenai, Alaska. 1983 summer of 1983 and four i've decided i'm going to merge some of these events into um one podcast because uh this is going very slowly and um a lot of uh stuff happened basically i was there one summer worked in kenai packers this uh cannery i'm going to tell you about then i went back to college uh, I didn't want to go back to college, but uh, you know this was my third year. I skipped my third year. I had one year left. Had to be on campus. There was uh, seemingly no way uh, to get around that. Although you'll hear later that I did find a way to get around it. After my experience in Alaska and some of the stuff I talked about last time uh, or the time before that, when I was in prison and I met all these people and my whole sense of uh, what I wanted my life to be shifted so dramatically, I decided I didn't want to go back to college. I just wanted to keep moving from Alaska. The plan was go to Japan, teach English there, make money, go to Asia, and off into the wild blue yonder. But uh, I called my dad, uh, my parents, to give him the news. And my dad said to me, look, uh, you know, I've always supported you. I support all your crazy ideas and these p- crazy plans you have. And uh, I never ask you to to change your your mind on my account. But just this one time, will you please consider going back to college and finishing? Because if it's only one more year and if you don't finish you might never get back to it and you're so close and you you know you're all set up you know everybody you're it, it's easy just go back you know it's a year it seems like a lot but it's not and um and you know he was right my dad's right he's he's a good guy he supported me always he helped me in all my harebrained adventures and this was the only time he ever said son please think think about this again And so I I did. I went back to college and finished at Hobart, although after living in my tent all this time, I was uh, I didn't I couldn't face living in a dorm again. Um, That was just, you know, too far from the way I'd been living all this time. And, And I was sort of resentful of the fact that I had to go. I felt like, you know, I felt like I felt like like an animal that had escaped from the zoo and was doing just fine out in the world. And then like found out I had to go back to the zoo for another year, uh, get back in that cage. So any gesture toward freedom that I could come up with, I latched onto. So when I, I did go back to to college in upstate New York, um, but I decided I was going to live in a little patch of forest out behind the art museum and so I set up my tent out there and lived in my tent uh, through the winter. I, well, but I was gone for a lot of the time, uh, which is another story I'll get to. But in any case, I lived in my tent. Uh, there was snow. There was all sorts of stuff going on. And um, eventually I went camping. I guess it was in spring. Yeah, it, it was in spring. I went camping with... A woman I was seeing at the time and we um, we used her tent because mine you know I was living in mine so it had books and you know the way it it was like I wasn't traveling right I was living in this thing so there's a lot of crap in there anyway um, you know books wine my my music was set up I had cassettes and a Walkman and speakers and you know all this stuff so we took her tent and um, When I came back, my tent was gone, but all my stuff had been taken out of the tent. And then I had this tarp, this like camouflage tarp that was hiding the tent because it was blue, I think. Um, And somebody had taken all my stuff out, taken the tent, put the tarp down in the area where the tent had been, neatly arranged all my things and wrapped them up in the tarp so that they wouldn't get wet if it rained what kind of thief has that much time and is completely not worried about getting caught either someone who knows i'm off camping for the weekend with this woman but then why wouldn't they just steal my stuff 
And why would they care if my shit got wet, right? If they're ripping me off, they're not that concerned about my well-being. You know who it was. It was the college maintenance crew. That's what I figure now. That they knew I was living out there. But they didn't want to fuck with me because I had already had some run-ins with the college administration um, about their... Well, it was about the food service that the, the supplied the food to the college. It was this shitty cafeteria kind of thing. And I was a vegetarian. And basically, if you're a vegetarian, it was like, hey, salad bar and steamed vegetables and good luck to you. So I said, well, I don't want to have to pay for this. I'll, you know, cook my own food. And they said, no, you have to pay for it. All students have to pay for this food thing. And then it turns out that the guy who owned this company, which also catered for cruise ships and colleges all over the country and military, it was a big company, that guy was a Hobart graduate and was on the board of directors and was a big cheese in the, you know, the, the administration of the school and all that. So he had this sweet little deal there where everyone who went to that college had to buy his shitty project product. And I was like, this is bullshit. So I wrote an article in the student newspaper and I started agitating saying, why is it that just because you're studying here, you've got to buy this food, even if you're not eating it because you're a vegetarian or whatever. And then I got called in. This was when I, in my sophomore year, I was a resident advisor, believe it or not. That's a crazy story I haven't gotten into here. Um, I showed up for the interview for the resident advisor thing wearing a tie-dye t-shirt, um, these bizarre like kung fu pants my mother had made out of a sheet for me, and wrap around Bootsy Collins sunglasses. I was high as hell and went as a lark because I was hanging out getting high with friends and they're like, hey, they're doing interviews, you should go, man, that'd be hilarious. So I did and I ended up getting the job. But anyway, what the hell am I talking about? Christ, I forget where I was. Um, right, so I had had this big run-in with those guys. And so they were going to like kick me out of school. They were going to do all this shit and all this stuff. And my father, back to my father, uh, I think he wrote them a letter. And basically what he said was, uh, you need to back down because if you take any action against my son... Um, I think 60 Minutes would find this to be a very interesting story. And I happen to know people who produce for 60 Minutes. And that's the next level we're going to here. So they completely backed down and uh, let me out of the food thing and whatever. Um, so I had had, and there were other run-ins as well, but I had had run-ins with the administration. I mean, the fact that I was off in, in Alaska um, skipping my junior year when they said, no, you can't just skip your junior year. And I said, well, look at the handbook. It says this and da, 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 and I've done that. Or da, da, da. So, I mean, technically I don't have to be here. Now, normally they would say, well, fuck you, kid. You have to be here. But since they'd already seen that if push came to shove, my dad was going to back me up and he had the wherewithal to at least make credible threats. They were just like, fine, just let this fucking kid, you know, just get him out of here, you know, <sighs> troublemaker. So the fact that I was living in my tent behind the art museum uh, was apparently well known to the administration, but they didn't know what to do about it because I'm sure there were no like statutes in the student handbook saying, you know, thou shalt not live in a tent behind the art museum. So. You know, again, if, if nobody's ever thought of pulling off the crime before, it may well be there's no law against it. Okay, so I think they knew I went camping that weekend and they came and removed my tent. Um, but they didn't want to fuck up my stuff. And they weren't worried about getting caught, A, because maybe they knew I was camping. And B, um, even if I wandered in there, they'd just be like, yeah, dude, whatever. Go talk to the dean, you know. Um, so... Uh, that's anyway, that was my junior year. I'll, 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 I mean, my senior year, I'll get into, um, that story in more detail and some of the other crazy shit that happened. But what I wanted to say is that I'm in this episode, I'm going to talk about the two summers that I was in Kenai, um, working on in, um, Kenai Packers. The first year I worked there work in, in quotation marks, as you'll hear, 
um, for about, uh, I think, seven or eight weeks, which is the whole season of, you know, when the, the salmon are coming in, maybe 10 weeks, I don't remember. Um, and then the second year I went up, I got a job there. I worked there for, I was there maybe like a week or two when I heard that there was an opening on a boat down in Seward and I immediately quit and hitchhiked to Seward to get this job on the boat. Um, which turns out was was gone by the time I got there, but I stumbled into another job on another boat. So that'll be a separate episode that I'll talk about um, one or two episodes down the line. So for now, what I'm doing, I'm going to conflate uh, stuff that happened the first summer and the very beginning of the second summer when I was working at the same cannery called Kenai Packers. So with that out of the way, um, let's talk about what it was like to work at a fucking salmon cannery in Alaska in the early 1980s. The first thing to know is that there are different operations going on in one of these canneries. The best place to be is in the freezer section. That's where they send the nice, the nice, clean, beautiful not rotten at all salmon um, to be flash frozen. They've been gutted. They're, you know, the heads are still on them, but they're flash frozen and shipped off to restaurants that are going to serve them beautifully. I don't know if they ship them back to Japan for sushi, but um, a lot of the stuff we were doing in Alaska went back to Japan. A lot of the, the seafood goes to Japan. Anyway, uh, that's the best place to be. I didn't get a job there. The, uh, then the second, plus, second best place to be is in the canning section. So that's where, you know, um, the fish are coming down a production line and there are machines that put them into cans. And so there are different positions along that where you're watching to make sure the cans aren't damaged and the fish are inserted, you know, sliced properly and put into the can and whatever. And the lid goes on right. And then they fill up these pallets and, um, you know, there's this like, uh, this rack with all these pallets and you, you slide that and you put that into, uh, these big, um, pressure cookers. So after the, the fish is already in the cans, they put them in these big, big pressure cookers and, you know, it's like a vault in a bank or something with like rails going in. You slide these things in. Once it fills up, you close the door, you twist it, you push the button and, you know, super high intensity heat and pressure uh, cooks the fish inside the can and sterilizes everything and great, right? So if you're in that area, that's also pretty cool because it's dry and, you know, it's nice, whatever. The worst place to be, which is where I was assigned, is the slime line. Uh, People who work on the slime line were known as slime monkeys. I was a slime monkey. That is where you're way up at the front in, you know, uh, upstream from the canning operation and you're getting fish coming in off the boats uh, that are not uh, suitable for the freezer section. So these are fish that are either kind of mangled or uh, a little rotted and whatever, like they're not pretty. Um, They run them through this big machine um, called the chink. And the chink is just this loud, crashing, boom, 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 machine that is supposed to kind of take off the head and gut it and rip off the fins and all this stuff. But, you know, these fish are all many different sizes and and, um, any machine like that is going to be very imprecise. So then the fish come out the other side of the chink and they come down these um, conveyor belts and then there are teams of slime monkeys waiting for them standing there in rain gear because you've got um, a cold water pipe spraying down onto your cutting board right in front of you so you're decked out in rain gear there's water everywhere there it's slippery there are fish guts everywhere there are people with knives everywhere it's not a good place to be really Um, but it's one of those things that is so bad that it's kind of good if you've got a perspective like I had, which is like, wow, I'm looking for adventure. I'm young. I'm crazy. It was wild to be on the slime line. Now, the chink 
Uh, I thought it was called the chink because it made that chinking, bunk, chink, 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 mechanical kind of noise all the time. Turns out it was called the chink because they used to have Chinese people who did that job, that sort of rough gutting job before it came down to the, you know, more um, <clears throat> sophisticated white slime monkeys uh, down the line. Anyway, you know, rampant racism, crazy exploitation. There were a lot of the workers there were Filipinos. They came up every, I guess they like flew them in from the Philippines every summer. The foreman was a Filipino and some of the sort of mid-level bosses were Filipinos. But it was a weird kind of segregated thing that because like they had been working there longer. So they had like they slept in dorm rooms and while we were sleeping in tents up in the field on the bluff. Uh, but then on the other hand, we were Americans, um, uh, some Alaskans who were working there, but generally if you were a native, you lived in Alaska, you could get a better job than that, uh, over the summer than working in, you know, for nine bucks an hour or something in the, in the cannery. Um, so most of the workers in my section and in the, the places I talked about before the canning section and the freezer were people like me. They were travelers. They were, you know, college students up for a lark in Alaska for the summer and paying for the trip by working for six or eight or ten weeks or whatever it was. And um, the reason Kenai Packers was the place to be is that they only ran one shift. The other cannery in town, don't remember what it was called, but they did two 12-hour shifts. Kenai Packers would run one shift and if they had a lot of food, they would run it like 18 hours and then give you six hours to sleep and you were back at it the next day. It was a seven day a week operation because the fish are coming in. You got to get them in cans or frozen as soon as possible to minimize the loss. So it's sort of an organic thing. You know, you're it's kind of like a military operation where like if shit's happening, you're on and you're on till it's over and there's no telling when that's going to be. I remember, I think it was, you would work, uh, two or maybe two and a half hours and then there'd be a 15 minute break. You'd go, you could stand in the sun and it was always coffee and cake. So sugar and caffeine and back to work. Um, you know, put the rain gear back on and get to it again. Now, this is pretty crazy work, right? Because what you're doing is you're standing there. You've got um, rubber gloves. You've got this gutting knife. You're, as I said, you're wearing, you know, all this rain gear with a hood and all that stuff. It's loud and freezing cold. You got that cold water spraying down on your hands. You got a um, plastic cutting board, and you're just taking the fish out of the conveyor belt and finishing the job that the chink started so you've got like the mangled head you got to get that off and then you've got the flippers and the dorsal fin and and you got to make sure like all the guts are out and the bloodline at the back by the spine of the fish is taken out and all that the guts all went into a particular chute next to your um well all the guts the flippers the head everything went into this hole next to your cutting board which was not garbage by the way that stuff was then packed into tanks and sold to cosmetics companies because the fat from the head and the guts of the salmon is the base of your finer cosmetics, ladies. Think about that. Uh, I do not eat sushi, and this is why. I have seen so much raw salmon in my life. Um, when I talk about working on the boat, I'll tell you, I actually was up to my neck, literally up to my neck in salmon regularly. I can't eat that shit. I mean, cook it fine. I love it, but sushi is forever. Um, not going to happen for me. So, uh, you're, you're there. So you're cutting these fish heads off and the fins and you're gutting and all that. And Look, I was a vegetarian, right? I was like a vegetarian who did way too much acid in those days. Uh, but after a couple of hours, I wasn't looking at animals. I wasn't looking at dead animals. I was just a machine. I was just doing what I was doing. I've probably gutted, uh, no idea, 20,000 fish. I have no idea how many I gutted, but... I, you know, it's a lot. And you're working there from, I think it was like 8 a.m. or maybe 7 a.m. And we worked right through, man, till like 1, 2 in the morning. Uh, 
you know, and then you'd like trudge up the hill, get in your tent, sleep, you know, everything stinks. There's no time to take a shower. I think we could do showers like twice a week or something. So you're kind of spraying off in the bathroom and it's just fucking gross and everything you own starts smelling like fish but you don't know right because you're immersed in it and some weird things happen in your brain too because like that first year they would they didn't let us wear a walkman so i think we we did a little bit and then they're like no 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 walkman they, they decided it was unsafe or something so you just had these earplugs and so you're just in your head Right. I mean, imagine being in your head, nothing coming in because what you're doing becomes so boring that you don't even see it after a while. Right. So it's a strange meditative kind of place that you're in. Um, and, you know, like I started first, I started singing songs to myself and I was amazed at, at all these songs I knew the words to. Like, I know all the words to every verse of American Pie. Like, I didn't know that. And then you're like peeling away the onions, the onion layers, right? And you get deeper and deeper because nothing new is coming in. There's no, that's why I say it's meditative. If, you have, if you've ever done a, like a meditation retreat, like I did this 10-day Vipassana retreat once, where you're just in silence for 10 days and you can't read and you can't talk to anybody. And so there's nothing coming in, right? And so what happens is you start processing things and normally you're just processing new shit. You know, it's like your your email inbox. If you get a lot of emails like I do, you got shit accumulated down there that you, you want to get to it, but you never can because just dealing with today's trying to keep it from getting worse uh, is all you can do. So there's all that stuff down there that you want to respond to, but you forget what it was. And, and, you know, someday when you're on a long airplane flight and they don't have Wi-Fi, maybe you can get to it, but it's like, ah, whatever. That's what our brains are like. You know, you, you've got all this stuff in there that you don't know is there because you haven't looked at it for so long, but believe me, it's in there. So if you get into a place like this or like prison, solitary confinement, or it's some sort of situation like this where you're not getting a lot of incoming stuff to deal with then what happens is your brain turns back and starts working on the accumulated stuff another way of thinking of it is like diet right if you're not eating a lot your your body starts eating the fat that you're carrying around with you same thing we've got all this accumulated you know memory calories we could call them and un unless you stop having incoming stuff you never turn and start burning that so anyway, I, I mean, like I remembered these like this friend that I had when I was four who stole my bicycle. His name was Gigi. Like who the fuck names their kid Gigi? I don't even know what that is. But yeah, I, so I remembered Gigi and, and like all this other stuff that I, I now I've forgotten it. But I remember at the time thinking, man, this is really this is wild, you know, that I'm, I'm accessing all this stuff I haven't thought of in so long. The other thing that happens is your brain starts to see fish guts everywhere, right? Because I'm staring, I'm looking at fish guts all day long, right? I, I just, that's all I'm doing. My hand that held the knife sort of froze into a fist. So even at night when I went home, I couldn't really open my hand because it was just, you know, holding this knife all day under a constant spray of cold water. I'm surprised I don't have like arthritis or something in my right hand at this point. But, um, you know, so I'd like in the morning, I'd go back and slip the glove on and then just slide the knife in and I could still grip it, but I couldn't really open my hand. Anyway, the brain, my brain, I started seeing fish guts in random shapes. So, for example, if, um, you know, at night after I, I went back to the tent, if I looked, if I saw like clouds in the sky, they would look like fish guts, right? Or in my tent, any sort of, you know, like a towel, like sort of thrown into the corner, that random folds of the towel, I saw fish guts. I saw fish guts everywhere. Um, and I could understand how 
you know, just seeing the malleability of the brain. Like if you're immersed in something, you start to see it everywhere. Um, and then it didn't help that, you know, my sleeping bag was like this salmon pink red color. And I would, you know, go after gutting fish all fucking day, I would go back to my tent and, you know, like slide the zipper down the, the ventral side of the sleeping bag and peel it open and crawl in. And then of course I'd have dreams about sleeping inside a salmon all night and all this crazy shit pretty wild man um but then here's what happened uh after a couple of weeks of this i was looking for a way out and i tried different things i tried sort of slipping myself into different like better situations in the slime line but the filipino guy always came and was like what are you doing go back go back where you were um but then one day one morning there was some confusion like there were someone else had been assigned to the slime line i think there were probably like between 30 and 40 of us there on the slime line and something happened somebody was there and there wasn't there weren't enough spaces so i sort of hung back and everyone else got their space and i was like oh there's no space for me and and the guy the the filipino guy said something like yeah okay just hold on a minute let me figure this thing out so I was standing there and then I walked into the dry canning area which had a a different um four four person there was a woman uh running that area and I went over there and I said to the woman there um there's some uh there's some overflow in the in that area do you want me to like sweep up while i'm waiting and she and she said sure and as she and i were talking i looked over and i saw the filipino guy was looking at us that we were he saw that she and i were talking so i like gestured yes okay okay and i took off my rain gear and i grabbed a broom and i started sweeping around the canning section and I noticed that the Filipino guy, the foreman of the of the slime line, just sort of ignored me because he thought that I was now working for her. And she thought that I was working for him and just like sweeping up to, you know, do do something while I was waiting for him to assign me to a different spot or whatever. So the two four people thought I was officially working for the other one, right? So I realized, I kind of sensed this, and I swept toward the back of the room and out the door and went over near where the bathroom was, and I went, I sort of like stashed my broom somewhere, and I went into the bathroom. I stood there for 10, 15 minutes, and nobody came for me. I, I looked out the door, nobody was looking for me. So I grabbed the broom, took it off into the bushes, hid it in the bushes, and I walked up to my tent. I hung out for the afternoon. Everything was cool. Then when it was time to, um, you know, I could could look down and see everybody working down there, and I could hear the bells and the the machines and everything. And when it was time to check out, I think it was for for dinner, there's like a half-hour dinner break, I walked down the hill, kept out of sight, grabbed my broom, like, swept back into the canning area, leaned the broom up against the wall, punched out, and left. No problem. Next morning, I went down, punched in, grabbed my broom, sort of do-do-do-do-do, out the door, stashed the broom, went back to my tent. (laughs) That was it. So that's how I spent the rest of the summer. I probably spent another four or five weeks um, just sort of sweeping in and out of there enough to punch in and punch out, and nobody ever missed me. So that was my career um, working at the cannery. That was a pretty good, pretty good gig. And it was also cool that the people who I was hanging out with, who, you know, <laughs> knew what I was doing, nobody ever narked on me or anything, which would have really sucked. Um, but uh, yeah, but it was, it, was, uh, it was pretty cool. And I knew I needed to get out of there. I, I, I was getting desperate to get out of there because 
you know, I talked about how the, you know, you go through all these songs and stuff in your head and just trying to amuse yourself. Well, when you run out of material, you run out of stuff to think about, then the brain just sort of goes off into random shit, you know, and you sort of don't even pay attention to it. And then like maybe something will jar you and you'll be like, oh, what, what the hell was I just thinking? What was that? That was weird. And what happened to me was, you know, I had run out of, I'd gone through all the music, all the songs that were in my head. And then I would start like just to spice it up a little bit, you know, cause I'd like done, you know, the theme to the Flintstones like 7,000 times. So now I would start doing it with different accents. And at one point I sort of heard in my head the theme to the Flintstones in a Chinese accent. And that, so there were all these like weird Chinese instruments in the back and they were singing Flintstone, we Flintstone, family Flintstone. And I thought, I'm losing my fucking mind, man. I got to get out of here. So that's more or less when the whole broom opportunity presented itself. And I slid, I swept out of, out of Kenai Packers forever. I met these people, three people, Catherine, um, and her fiance Ralph and their friend Jimbo. These people were artists. Uh, Ralph and Jimbo were um, studying performance art, and Catherine was a painter. And they were all studying together at some art institute in. I, I used to think it was in Chicago, but I guess it was in L.A. I, I don't. I don't really know, and I don't want to give too many details I mean, it doesn't matter there's nothing terrible about this but um i'm still in touch with with catherine uh she's a very close friend actually which is bizarre since 1983 right and we're still very close friends so what happened was catherine and ralph her fiance had decided that they were going to go and have this adventure in alaska so they got a car they had like a pinto or a vega or some piece of shit car they'd bought and they were going to drive it from L.A. to Alaska, which is a long fucking drive, let me tell you. And some this guy Jimbo, who was studying with them, a friend, decided he wanted to go with them. So the three of them do this colossal road trip to Alaska. And keep in mind, these are like artists. You know, they're doing like an MFA degree or something. So um, they're even less... Uh, prepared for this sort of thing than I was. Anyway, by the time I met them, you know, it had been a long road trip. And at this point, Catherine and Ralph were having a lot of problems in their relationship. And Jimbo was in love with Catherine. And Catherine was just fucking sick of the two of these guys. And anyway, so I sort of fell into this group and became friends with them. They were very amusing, very very sort of dark, ironic, uh, wry, you know, uh, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like hanging out with Tom Waits or something in Alaska, you know, or, or, uh, Andy Warhol, you know, it's just like someone completely out of their element, but laughing their ass off cause it's so bizarre, but also meanwhile, having this big domestic psychodrama between the three of them. And sort of what happened was like Jimbo and Ralph both sort of thought it was important to convince me that they had the, you know, they were really the one for Catherine. And so I was getting all these weird, you know, like, no, you know, Ralph doesn't deserve her. And I'm the one I'm blah, blah from Jimbo. And then Ralph would be, you know, and I, you know, what do I have to say about it? I don't, I don't even know you people, but, and it was always done with a laugh too. That was the weird thing. There was a lot of laughter in there. I'll put a, I'll post a photo on Chris Ryan PhD in the talking out my ass section of the three of them. A beautiful, hilarious photo. Um, you'll you'll understand why it's hilarious when you see it. I didn't really get a chance to talk with Catherine much. Um, I was more getting the perspective of these two guys. And then one day I was out walking on the bluff by myself. And I came upon Catherine sitting there watching the sun, you know, the mountains across the Kenai Inlet. Um, amazing view, just incredible view of the snow-covered volcanoes across that water. And and I sat down and we talked for a while and she was just so lovely and so smart and 
quirky and and obviously suffering with these guys just you know the the whole situation kind of sucked and and I don't know we we really connected and around this time uh things had gotten so bad with Ralph that he uh decided he was going to leave and go work on a floating cannery in uh in uh, Prince, what's it called? Prince William Sound, I think. The the down near Seward, there were these floating ships where they they would like do the whole canning production we were doing out at sea. And so he got a job on one of those, and he took off, and he was gone for a while. And then Jimbo, of course, thought that was his great chance, but she was so sick of these guys. And anyway, so Catherine and I kind of hooked up, right? Which pissed Jimbo off, as you can imagine. But I didn't care. I mean, I liked this woman. She was great. She was beautiful. She's still beautiful. She's she's just a classic like movie star beauty. She's she's um she's really something. Anyway, so she and I hooked up and um she started sleeping in my tent with me, which was kind of intense cuz we're we're working 18 hour days, right? So it's not like we've got a lot of time for the romance. But uh she's sleeping in my tent with me and You know, sleeping in a tent in Kenai is kind of weird because there are bears, you know. There are all sorts of animals wandering around and and crazy people. Um, And when you're in a tent, you're aware that there's no wall, you know. There's, There's this very fine piece of fabric, and all it really does is blind you to what's out there. So you hear these weird sounds at night, and... Plus, you're in a sleeping bag, so you can't even, like, get your arms out. You know, you're completely vulnerable. And you hear these noises, and you think, geez, if that's a bear, man, I won't know until its claw comes through that piece of material six inches from my face. So it's a, it's a, you're in a very vulnerable spot. We're lying there one night, sound asleep. Sound asleep. And I hear someone say, Chris. Chris. Wake up. Chris. I said, what, what? Chris, this is Ralph. No, fucking Ralph is supposed to be on some floating cannery, right? He left a couple weeks ago. And now I'm, hey, Ralph? He says, yeah. Is Catherine with you? And I'm thinking, oh, shit, man. He could have a fucking machete out there. Anything can happen here. And I'm, I was sound asleep, right? And all I could think is, I need more time. I need time to think. I need time to think. So I said, um, wait, I'll check. <laughs> no, I'm in a fucking tent, right? Like, it ain't a big tent. So, hey, is your name Catherine? Hey, where's Catherine? Anyway, yeah, so Catherine was there. So she went out. I woke her up. She went out. They went off and, you know yelled at each other or did what couples do and um the next day I got up and and I went down to work and this is before the broom situation because I was still I was there and when I came back at lunch in front of my tent was a small crucifix that Ralph had made and he'd put my hiking boots on it because I was wearing rubber waders and the you know for work He'd put my Nike hiking boots on this crucifix and set it on fire. So when I came home, there was this burning cross with two globs of melted rubber and leather. That, my friends, is what happens when you sleep with a performance artist's fiancée.